Chapter 25, Concepts of Care for Patients with Infectious Respiratory Conditions. We'll begin by talking about seasonal influenza on page 584. Um, this is common, can lead to complications of pneumonia or death, especially in our older adult population or those with comorbidities such as heart failure, chronic lung disorders, and our immunocompromised patients. Outside of those at-risk groups or higher risk groups, most patients can be treated at home, um, but hospitalization may be needed when symptoms are severe or the patient develops complications. This is a highly contagious acute respiratory virus, um, rapid onset of severe headache, muscle aches, fever, chills, fatigue, weakness, and anorexia um, is potentially preventable, or at least the severity of the um, infection as well as complications can be reduced with vaccination. The vaccine is changed every year based on which specific viral strands were most common to cause influenza illness during the influenza season. Um, usually the vaccines contain um, antigens for three or four um, viral strands expected to be prevalent in that season. The recommended route of vaccination is an IM injection. Um, for our older adults and those with comorbidities or immunocompromised states, there is the um, the trivalent, quadrivalent um, vaccine that's available at a higher dose um, that tends to be more effective at protection with adults with age-related reduced immunity. Um, remember um, to teach the patient who's sick to reduce the risk for spreading um, the virus by thoroughly washing hands, especially after blowing nose, sneezing, coughing, rubbing eyes, and touching face. Other precautions include staying home from work, school, and avoiding crowding places, covering mouth and nose um, with the tissue when sneezing or coughing, disposing of these properly, and avoiding all, all or at least close contact with other people. It is diagnosed um, with a rapid influenza swab. Um, there is common um, association of these being um, false positive, so um, sometimes patients are treated um, based on their known exposure, the timing of the year, and then their symptoms. Instruct the patient to rest for several days, ensure adequate hydration, and monitor for complications. Your antiviral agents may be effective, but if the key with this is starting it within the window of 24 to 48 hours to achieve effectiveness at preventing replication of the virus. Pandemic influenza is on 574 of your text. Um, a pandemic respiratory virus infection is one that has the potential to spread globally um, because the virus has potentially infected other people, animals, um, most birds and animal viruses cannot be transmitted to humans. We note a few exceptions to these have occurred with viruses in past years with mutation of viruses then becoming highly infectious to humans causing a global pandemic. Um, epids and um, some examples listed in your book um, or 1918 Spanish influenza, COVID-19, um, the 2009 H1N1, um, influenza A. The um, COVID virus family, um, in addition to causing just the common cold or upper respiratory um, viruses in humans, um, includes bird and animal strains that have caused serious respiratory in, um, influenzas in 2002 and 2003. Um, COVID virus 2 jump species and was responsible for SARS. That's y'all probably remember hearing that in the news, severe acute respiratory syndrome. And then in 2012, we had another mutation um, of the COVID viruses responsible for MERS um, COVID, and that was the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which um, had a high um, mortality rate, but was really um, limited um, demographically um, to the Middle East. And then, of course, in December of 2019, extending into early 2020, the world experienced um, COVID virus, um, the pandemic of COVID-19. Um, evidence shows that COVID-19 is sped um, via droplet transmission. Um, there still continues to be research about investigation into airborne transmission um, can occur um, in the absence of a medical procedure such as poorly ventilated indoor settings.
in the latest numbers in the U.S. is there 6.3 million people um, have been affected with 191,248 well, 191, deaths, reflecting a death rate of um, 3%. If we compare this to, let's say, your book lists the seasonal influenza from 2018 to 2019, this resulted in 34,200 deaths, which had a death rate of 0.1%. So um, striking um, mortality rate. Statistics with COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 statistics continue to change um, daily. Um, we are gaining a lot of evidence-based knowledge related to precautions, increased testing, um, antivirals, and a better understanding of our care um, for patients with COVID-19. Um, some patients can develop COVID-19 and be asymptomatic or experience minimal symptoms. Other experiencing minor respiratory symptoms similar to a common cold and recover with no apparent long-term Affects others, particularly those high risk groups, those with pre existing conditions, older adults, immunocompromised, um, can develop a viral pneumonia leading to acute respiratory distress. Um, your key features box for COVID 19 for symptoms um, are listed on page 568. These symptoms appear 2 to 14 days after exposure. Now we're going to talk about pneumonia. This is on 580 of your text. Um, this is excessive fluid in the lungs. Inflammation causing pneumonia can be triggered by an infectious organism or by inhaling an um, irritating agent. Inflammation, which is just our normal tissues response to injury, allergy, or invasion of a pathogen, tends to occur in interstitial spaces like the alveoli and, and the bronchioles. This process begins when the pathogens or the irritant penetrate the airway mucosa and then multiply in the alveolar space. Then we have a response of our immune system with white blood cells moving into this area. Um, this is going to cause increased capillary leak and fluid edema and formation of exudates. Um, this exudate can then collect in and around the alveoli, um, impairing gas exchange and thickening walls of alveoli. Um, both of these events are going to reduce your gas exchange, leading to hypoxemia, and that um, brings in the increased risk of mortality with pneumonia. If this organism moves into your bloodstream, sepsemia and sepsis results, um, the infection can extend into um, your pleural cavity and um, lead to a collection of pus in the pleural space. Um, fibrin and edema stiffen your lung tissue, therefore it's not compliant um, with being elastic and helping um, with vital capacity and then you have alveolar collapse or atelectasis um, further reducing gas exchange. Table 25.6 on page um, 581 of your text compares community, community associated pneumonia and um, healthcare um, acquired pneumonia Non-infectious agents, again, any irritant or inhalation of a toxic gas, chemical fuse and smoke, um, potential for aspiration of water, food, and fluid, um, and vomit can also be um, a source that contributes to the development of a pneumonia. Now, infectious pneumonia can be categorized, again, as either a community or hospital acquired or healthcare facility acquired, um, or even ventilator associated. And you'll talk in 2930 on some bundles implemented usually in intensive care units to try to prevent ventilated associated pneumonia. Health promotion and maintenance regarding pneumonia. The key here is um, to advocate for vaccination. For those who have um, never received any pneumococcal vaccines, current recommendation by the CTC is Prevnar 15 or Prevnar 20 for adults 65 and older and those 19 to 64 who have certain conditions or risk factors. Um, if they've if they are utilizing Prevnar 15, then they should finish out the series with a dose of Pneumovax 23. Um, those adults who have previously received other pneumococcal vaccines, including Prevnar 13 or Prevnar 7, um, need to have detailed discussions with providers about how to complete their vaccine series. Um, those that are 65 and older who did get Prevnar 20 um, have completed um, their series. Other 
key things to remember are avoiding crowded spaces during flu season, um, encouraging cough turn, moving and deep breathing, cleaning respiratory equipment, um, smoking sensation, adequate rest and hydration, um, healthy diet, and then drinking three waters a day unless you have comorbidities that limit your fluid intake. Many patients with pneumonia um, are going to have flushed cheeks and be very anxious, um, may report chest pain, discomfort, malaise, headache, chills, fever, cough, um, tachycardia, dyspnea, uh, bloody sputum or increased sputum production, severe muscle weakness may also be present. Um, you want to observe their breathing pattern, their position, and use of any accessory muscles. The patient with hypoxia and reduced gas exchange, again, is going to usually appear uncomfortable and anxious, um, will not be comfortable in a lying position, will have to sit upright, um, and again may even achieve or try to achieve the presence of that tripod positioning, that balancing with leaning forward to offload that fluid um, so they can better oxygenate. Assess the cough, amount, color, consistency, and odor of any sputum produced. Assess for any crackles on auscultation. This is where fluid um, is in the interstitial and alveoli areas. It makes breath sounds difficult may note some wheezing due to inflammation or as this general exudate as a concurrent effect of inflammation is nearing the airways. Bronchial breath sounds are heard over dense areas of consolidation. Uh, your patient with pneumonia who's an older adult um, often has additional symptoms like um, hypotension. They may demonstrate orthostatic changes. They may have a rat rapid weak pulse, um, dehydration, um, increased risk for dysrhythmias, so making sure um, that you understand that their presentation may be different. And because of that, um, you always kind of have to prioritize um, a more thorough workup for them because they can present with a vaguer symptom that's not isolated to their respiratory status. Your patient-centered adult, older adult consideration box on 583. Your older adult with pneumonia may have fatigue, weakness, lethargy, of, um, confusion, poor appetite. Fever and cough may be ab um, absent, but hypoxia is often present. The most common symptoms of, it, of pneumonia in the older adult is changing cognition, which we know we associate that with almost all of our infectious disorders in our older adult, and this is due to hypoxia. And acute and acute uh, confusion. White count may not be elevated um, because they have this... Um, lack of immune response with age until infection is severe. So um, waiting to treat the disease into more typical symptoms can greatly increase the risk of sepsis or death. So you want to advocate with your patient and your family members. I know um, this does not seem like pneumonia, but your presentation will be very different. It's important that we get more of a diagnostic um, evaluation, which is going to be a chest x-ray for your older adult. Laboratory assessment of pneumonia, sputum is often obtained um, and examined by gram stain culture and sensitivity. However, unfortunately, the responsible organ can be very difficult to identify with the sputum culture. CBC is actually is usually going to show an elevated white count, except in our older adult population. Blood cultures performed to assess if there's um, sepsemia or entrance of this organism into the bloodstream. Severely ear patients may also get um, ABGs to assess for respiratory um, acidosis and any need for supplemental oxygen based on their PaO2 level. Serum electrolytes, BUN and creatinine are also prioritized. Remember that a higher BUN in the setting of um, a normal creatinine would indicate dehydration. Lactic acid may be performed to assess for sepsis. Um, lactate is formed when cell respiration occurs without oxygen. So that can be happening in pneumonia because we got hypoxemia. Um, elevated lactate levels um, can indicate patients' risk of septic shock. Lactic acid um, levels at or above four are considered a high enough um, when usually usually cutoffs around two. Um, so once it starts creeping towards that four or more, they do correlate this more with the sepsis um, complication of pneumonia. Patients with high lactate levels, um, they'll trend them to see that they're trending back down to normal, um, knowing that as it trends back to normal, 
or to a lower level, they have a higher chance of survival than those that remain at the same level or increase. Again, you want to prioritize um, a chest x-ray, especially in your older adults, um, because they may have more vague symptoms, a febrile mental status changes um, that we may not align with pneumonia. Prioritizing hypothesis. So there's a potential um, for decreased gas exchange due to decreased diffusion at the alveolar capillary membrane, potential for airway obstruction due to inflammation with excessive mucus secretions, fatigue, and muscle weakness, potential for sepsis due to the presence of microorganisms in the very vascular area of the lungs, and then reduced immunity in our immunocompromised population or older adults, and then potential for um, consolidation of infection infection in the pulmonary space um, that can spread from the lungs into the area between the visceral and parietal spaces. Now let's talk about strategies to improve gas exchange, preventing airway obstruction, and preventing sepsis. Interventions to improve gas exchange are similar to those we've talked about with COPD. Nursing priorities include delivery of oxygen therapy and assisting patient with bronchial hygiene. Oxygen therapy is usually delivered by nasal cannula or mask unless hypoxia is not improving with these devices. Um, you want to encourage use of the IS. Um, encourage them to sit up when using it. Um, exhale fully, place that mouthpiece in their mouth, and then take a long, slow, deep breath in, raising that piston as high as possible, holding it at that peak for two to four seconds before slowly exhaling. Teaching them to perform this five to 10 breaths per session every hour while awake. And then preventing airway obstruction, um, ensuring that they cough, deep breathe, they move, reposition at least every two hours, increase their fluids to two liters per day unless they're on a fluid restriction. Utilization of bronchodilators such as albuterol um, to help with bronchospasms. Steroids may also be utilized when um, inflammation from the pneumonia and airway swelling is present. And also utilization of mucinex um, to help thin out secretions. With preventing um, sepsis, this is where selection of the drugs by the provider and route of these drugs is based on how they believe the pneumonia was acquired. Was it community, hospital, or healthcare associated pneumonia? How ill the patient appears? What organism is believed to be involved? And whether the patient has increased risk for complications like reduced immunity? If the patient does develop a collection of pl um, pus within the pleural space outside the lung cavity, this may be managed um, with drainage, additional antibiotics being prescribed, and possibly a chest tube to help with lung re-expansion. The lung recovery phase, especially in our older adults, can be frustrating um, after pneumonia. The fatigue, weakness, and residual cough can last for weeks, so just making sure your patient is aware of the recovery timeline. Um, patients may fear a lack of return to normal of functioning. It um, may be consideration for pulmonary rehab for this patient. Emphasize the importance of completing all um, antimicrobial treatment. Instruct them to notify their PCP if they develop fever, chills, persistent cough, dyspnea, wheezing, increased sputum production, chest pain, or increased fatigue. Teach them to avoid crowds, especially in the fall and winter months. Um, avoid others who may be ill and exposure to irritants, making sure they're up to date on vaccines, and then a balanced diet and adequate fluid are essential. Prioritization of um, reevaluation to see if we've achieved our outcomes here of um, our client being able to maintain gas exchange with a patent airway um, free from additional or um, persistent infection. And then we aid in helping them return to their pre pneumonia health status.
Next, we're going to talk about pulmonary um, tuberculosis, page 585 of your text. Um, highly contagious. It's transmitted via aerosol. Um, there can be primary or secondary or latent TB. This is when there's reactivation of the disease in a person that was previously infected. Um, typically, only a small amount of people who are infected um, will ever develop active TB disease. Not all TB infections will develop into active disease. This is because the normal protection of our immunity um, prevents full development of TB in, in most um, healthy populations. Again, secondary infection is when there's been reaction after immunosuppression. Um, H HIV smoking, so some risk factors that impaired our immunity response. Cell-mediated immunity against TB usually develops two to ten weeks after the initial infection, and this is where um, it may be evidenced by a positive reaction on um, a TB skin test or a PPD. The process of TB infection can occur um, in this order where you have um, granulation inflammation. This is caused by the TB um, bacteria in itself um, becomes surrounded by collagen, fibroblasts, and lymphocytes. This is our body trying to head it off and prevent further spread. Um, then there may be formation of necrotic tissue which turns into a granular mass um, that you'll see in the center of the lesion and this is what may be first detected on a chest x-ray. Um, initial infection is seen more often in the upper lobes of the lung. The local lymph nodes are also infected and, and enlarged. And then there's asymptomatic periods that usually follow this primary or initial infection, which can last for years or decades before clinical symptoms develop. Um, and that's where your latent TB can come in. Um, an infected person is um, not contagious to others unless symptoms of the disease occur. In North America, the adults that are at greatest risk for the development of TB are those who are in constant frequent contact with an untreated infected person, so someone who has not received antibiotic therapy, those who have reduced immunity or current HIV infection, adults who live in crowded areas such as long-term care facilities, homeless shelters, older homeless adults, use of injection drugs or alcohol, lower socioeconomical status, and then foreign immigrants from less affluent countries. A TB assessment is going to consist of noting a patient with a persistent cough, along with an unintentional weight loss, anorexia, night sweats, hemoptysis, shortness of breath, fever, or chills. You want to ask also a part of their history, have they had the BCG vaccine? This is often given in childhood overseas. This actually contains an attenuated um, bactocillus that is similar to, to TB. So anyone who has received the BCG vaccine within the previous 10 years will actually have a positive skin test. Um, and then that can lead to complications with interpretation as a current TB infection. Patients um, who have the positive TB skin test are further evaluated with um, a chest x-ray, um, the quantiferum gold test for evaluation of a current active TB infection. Diagnostic workup for someone who's being considered to have pulmonary tuberculosis. Um, usually, initially, it's determined with the tuberculin skin test. Um, this is the most reliable used screening for TB, one we're probably most familiar with working in healthcare. This is a small amount, usually 0.1 milliliter of purified protein derivative is placed intradermally in the forearm. This test is read in 48 to 72 hours, identified as positive. If there's an area of induration, localized swelling, or hard tissue. So not just the redness, but also evidence of induration. Measuring 10 millimeters or greater in, in diameter indicates exposure and possible current infection with TB. 
in adults with reduced immunity, we do reduce this in duration um, measurement to five millimeters, resulting in a positive. A positive reaction, again, indicates exposure to TB um, or the presence of inactive dorm dormant disease, not active disease. Um, a reduced skin reaction or negative skin test does not rule out TB disease or infection of the very old or anyone who may be severely immune. Um, uh, have a severe immune compromise. Your quantiferin gold test um, shows how the person's immune system responds to the TB bacterium. A positive test does mean that that person is currently infected with TB, but does not indicate what phase this is in, whether this is latent or active disease. So then next would be a sputum culture to confirm the diagnosis. Um, and this would also be used to determine eradication once treatment has been completed. Annual screening is needed for anyone who comes into contact for those infected with TB. So that's commonly wise healthcare workers and nurses will have that annual assessment. Once a person's skin test is positive, um, that's when the workup again will begin with the chest X-ray to assess for active disease or old here old healed lesions, um, usually um, as calcifications, and then some secondary inflammation may also be seen, but that's more concerning for active at that point. Interventions um, include promoting airway clearance, reducing drug-resistant infection spread, improving nutrition, and managing fatigue due to this lengthy disease, risk for poor gas exchange, and increased energy demand. Next, we're going to talk about the management of TB and nursing interventions. I encourage you that if you've been skipping through slides or not paying close attention that you tune in here. We're going to promote airway clearance with our TB patients. Interventions to maintain a patient airway are similar to those for pneumonia and COPD that we've already discussed. You want to instruct your patient to drink plenty of fluids unless there's another comorbidity that's requiring a fluid restriction. Teach him or her to take deep breaths before coughing. We want to utilize an incentive spirometer to also facilitate effective coughing techniques. Next, we're going to talk about reducing drug resistance and spread of infection. You want to be familiar with the first-line therapy for non-resistant TB that's um, listed in box 5 um, on page 579. Usually, it is a utilization of multi-antibiotic therapy for the first initial phase of treatment that usually lasts 8 weeks. The patient will then continue another 18 weeks um, if they have been successful treatment in the first eight weeks and may continue to take rifampin um, either daily or twice a week. Some of these drugs are also used for shorter periods um, if it's for latent TB infections instead of active TB. Um, patients who remain um, culture positive after eight weeks or those who may have history of HIV and are not currently taking antiviral therapy, they may require longer um, treatment periods of up to seven months of continuous therapy. I encourage you to note the similarities in the nursing implications under your TB um, drug therapy box. Remind patients to avoid alcoholic beverages while on the multi-drug regimen because the liver damaging effects of these drugs that are potentiated by alcohol. You want to teach your patient to report any darkening of urine, yellow appearance to skin or the whites of the eyes, and increased tendency to bruise or bleed, which are all signs and symptoms of liver toxicity or failure. The reason um, for the increased bruising or bleeding is indicative of liver injury as the liver synthesizes a lot of our clotting factors. We would typically see in our patients who have liver injury prolonged PT and INR. Let's remember that normal INR is 1.3 to 2 and normal PT range is 11 to 15 seconds. Also highlight the drug alert box on 578. This is reminding you again that the first line drugs used as Therapy for TB all can damage the liver. Continue to advise you to warn your patient to not drink any alcoholic beverages for the entire duration of TB treatment. 
you want to encourage strict adherence to the prescribed drug regimen. This is important for eradicating and suppressing the disease. Adherence can be difficult due to the long duration of treatment. You may have patients who are hospitalized with active TB. In a hospital, hospital setting, they are placed on airborne precautions in a well-ventilated room with at least six exchanges of fresh air per minute. Um, all healthcare um, workers do wear a, a respirator during airborne precautions. Typically, these precautions are discontinued when the patient is no longer contagious. You want to talk with your patient about infection prevention strategies, um, what to do about disease monitoring, and how to conserve energy for participating in activities. Because TB, if typically treated outside the acute care setting um, with the patient at home, airborne precautions are not necessary with treatment at home because these family members have already been exposed. You may have family members express concerns um, about the disease process, um, their possibility of infection, um, treatment for them, or if um, they're visiting their family member in the hospital setting on airborne precautions. You want to ensure you're using therapeutic communication techniques and asking um, what their specific fears are so that you can help address their concerns. We're going to focus on nutrition for our patients with TB. Make sure they have a diet rich in protein, iron, and vitamins. You want to educate him or her um, that a dietitian may be helpful. And continue to avoid alcohol um, with their medication regimen. Evaluating outcomes, making sure our patient is able to effectively clear airways, is free of active TB disease, um, does not spread the infection to others, demonstrates improved nutrition, decreased fatigue, and increased energy, and able to return to their pre-tuberculosis health status. Rhinosinusitis on page 589 of your text. Um, inflammation, this interferes with sinus drainage. Um, this can be due to a deviated nasal septum, nasal polyps, tumors, inhaled air, um, pollutants, cocaine, allergies, facial trauma, dental infection. Even those, um, when the problem starts with the non-infectious agents and those we just listed, um, this swelling and inflammation blocks the flow of secretions from the sinuses, which then makes a breeding environment for bacteria or virus. Most episodes, thank goodness, are virus-related, meaning they do not need treatment with antibiotic therapy. Complications to monitor for include cellulitis, abscess, and meningitis. Drug therapy, um, for virus-related rhinosinusitis includes decongestants, antihistamines, intranasal steroid spray to block or reduce the amount of chemical mediators in the nasal and sinus um, tissue so we can relieve local inflammation. Antipyretics are given for fever and analgesics may be given for pain. Um, to note your older adult care consideration box on 589, first generation histamines like Benadryl um, may be inappropriate for older adults, really any adults, because these patients can have um, reduced drug clearance, higher risk for confusion, anticholinergic effects such as dry mouth and constipation, um, may also experience sedation, tachycardia, hypotension, so just common drugs um, with the first generation class that we avoid in our older adults. Um, nursing safety priority. Um, also want to make sure if your patient is being treated with antibiotics for a bacterial rhinosinus infection that they complete the entire course even with symptoms of or subside. They still complete the current treatment. 
This action will help eradicate the organism, prevent development of resistant bacteria strains. Peritonsillar abscess on page 589 of your text. Um, this is um, complications of acute bacterial tonsillitis. Infection is being spread from the tonsil to the surrounding tissue. Then um, there's usually formation of an abscess that becomes large enough to um, obstruct the airway. Most patients fortunately can be treated as outpatients with antibiotics, so though some may be steroids to reduce swelling and prevent further airway um, impairment. I have seen patients have drainage of these abscesses um, in acute care settings as well. Your patient usually reports with um, throat pain, fever, difficulty swallowing. Um, you may note bad breath, swelling lymph nodes, um, and um, pus behind the tonsils that's then pushing for the uvula to be deviated. So it's uh, deviating to the opposite side um, of the pharynx. Um, antibiotics, again, is usually the treatment strategy, stressing the importance of completing therapy, um, going to the emergency department if they note any um, airway obstruction, drooling, um, and strider um, uh, may occur, restlessness, anxiousness, hypoxia symptoms. Inhalation anthrax, um, this is a bacterial infection, begins on 590 of your text, usually spread by contaminated soil. Uh, fatality rate if infection occurs in lungs is fatal at 100% if left untreated. This one also presents with two stages, the predominal stage where your patient may have flu-like symptoms and then progression to severe onset um, of the illness after initially feeling um, improved or better um, from the flu-like state. Your um, box here is box 25.8 from your text. It's important that you can differentiate early and late symptoms of inhalation anthrax. When infection occurs in the lungs, um, again, the fatality right here is 100%, so the importance is identification at the early stage um, for effective treatment. What's happening here is the active bacteria produce toxins that are released into effective tissues and into the bloodstream, making this infection worse. There's massive edema occurring with the hemorrhage and destruction of lung cells. Infected white blood cells then spread the organisms rapidly to lymph nodes and blood, causing bacteremia, sepsis, and um, potentially for meningitis. The lethal toxins produced by the bacteria are the reason for the 100% mortality rate. A key feature, again, is differentiating the, the stages here with the early stage. The feature is it being um, commonly associated with upper respiratory infections such as sore throat, rhinosinus. Usually the patient starts to feel better um, two to four days after these symptoms. Um, unfortunately, then there is usually severe onset of severe disease, including respiratory distress, um, hemiemesis, um, strider, chest pain, and cyanosis, with death usually occurring 24 to 36 hours even with antibiotic treatment. So again, that's not effective if, if we're recognizing this to that severe state. Um, drugs that can be used to treat include um, cyclofoxin, docacycline, amoxicillin, revampin, clindamycin, and vancomycin. They may be used individually or um, together to combat and try to prevent the illness when they've um, been exposed but do not have symptoms as well. So teach patients with any type of lower respiratory infection to watch for changes after they think they're getting well and to seek medical attention immediately. Geographical respiratory infection is discussed on FAVE. 590 of your text. This includes a variety of respiratory infections, um, usually with the organism that's most common with a certain geological area, um, but other than that, the incidence of the infection being low. Therefore, adults living in this area most commonly will um, develop an immunity to the organism over time um, and only develop the infection if they come into contact with a large number of the particular organisms or they have suppressed immune response. Um, these organisms are part of this geological environment, um, so healthy adults in these areas are most susceptible to infection. 
or those who have intense exposure for soil-borne organisms, um, adults who dig in the soil, farm, or construction, um, have an occupation that increases your risk and distribution via the soil can be heavily exposed. Um, the soil can also be disrupted by dust storms, tornadoes, flooding, and other types of natural disasters and lead to acute infections. Most of these respiratory infections resemble influenza or pneumonia with cough, fever, headache, muscle aches, chest pain, and night sweats. So therefore, they may go undiagnosed and identified as um, a, a different or incorrect um, disease. Identification, identification of a specific organism is important so that then we can activate appropriate treatment and try to prevent complications. Um, key here in your history taking portion, this is why we always ask about travel, um, you know, have you, where have you traveled to recently? That's to help identify anyone with respiratory infection infections who may have visited one of these geological regions um, to help identify what the organism may be and being they were not um, been a part of that environment at, during most of their adulthood, they don't have the immune response to combat it. Okay, so very important in the history taking you ask where, where have you traveled to recently. Supportive care is similar to that for patients with influenza or pneumonia, um, depending on the particular organism involved.